Okay, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening. We're gonna just give a few minutes to allow people to join. So while we're waiting, why not put your um, shout outs in the chat box? Where are you from and where are you watching from? I'm here in New Zealand, in Auckland, and welcome to everybody. I can see those numbers climbing. I'll just give it a few more minutes. And as I said, please um, pop where you're watching from in our chat box. Okay, I can see the time is 8 a.m. Um, here in New Zealand, so I'm going to get started. Hello and greetings to you all. Welcome to the second IZD webinar in our Unpacking the Strategy series. Uh, this initiative was created by the IZD board to provide support and professional development for all of you to help meet the new conservation education strategy. My name is Sarah Thomas and I'm based here at Auckland Zoo in New Zealand. I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. And also I wanna say thanks to Nettie Pletcher, who's our IZD administrator, and she'll be our technical supervisor for today. So whilst people are joining, some housekeeping notices. So please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and that recording will be posted onto our IZD YouTube channel. So by staying and participating, you are consenting to being part of this recording. And hello to all the viewers who are watching from the IZD channel later on. And to know if you did miss the first webinar in our series, that is up there at the moment on our YouTube channel. Um, as this is a webinar, you'll all be on mute as viewers, but please look at the question and answer box and pop your questions in as our speakers move through. Um, and if you've got a question for a specific presenter, please put their name against that so we can get it to the right kind of person. Um, so Nettie, I think we're gonna start our first poll. Um, and this is just to kind of see um, where people have, uh, are coming from, what kind of membership they have. For those of you are watching later, you won't see that poll on your screen, but the first question asks about your IZD membership level. Are you an institutional member, an individual member, associate, or not an IZD member? And the second question asks, where did you hear about this webinar? Was it through social media, the IZD website, email, or from an IZD regional representative? So we'll just give you about 30 seconds to fill in those two choices and then we can um, uh, see where we're at with the kind of viewers that we have here today. Excellent, we're at 80% voted. I'm going to close the poll and we'll see the results. Great, thank you, Nettie. Let's have a look at those results. So I can see in question number one that we have the 50% of you are individual members and 31% of ind individual institutional members. And then how did you hear about the, um, the webinar? Uh, the biggest um, uh, total is by the ISAD email, 59%, and also through our social media was next popular. So great, that's really uh, good to see. And um, we do have a, another poll, um, and this is really to kind of see where you're at with the strategy. And um, we've got a couple of questions. One is about uh, the conservation education plan. And the other one is about where you're at in terms of implementing the strategy. So if you're watching live, you should be able to see those two polls now. So the first one asks you uh, about whether you have a conservation education plan. Do you have one that fully meets these the recommendations in the strategy? Do you have one that partially meets it? Or do you not have a written conservation education plan or do you not know and the second question is that what stage are you at at implementing the strategy have you read the document but nothing else you've watched the first webinar and it was helpful uh, have you had conversations with colleagues 
Um, and or is your organization starting to make a plan that implements those changes? So we'll give you uh, again about 30 seconds to have a think of um, those answers. And Netty, once we've got a good percentage, we'll close that poll. This one has more words. It takes just a minute longer for people to process. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so um, if we look at the, uh, the first question in that poll, the majority of you um, do have a written conservation education plan that partially meets this recommendation, about 50%. And then the second question says, where are you at um, with implementing the strategy? So the, the highest percentage today is that your organization is starting to make a plan to implement the changes that meet these recommendations. And that's really great to hear um, and see because at, on our first webinar, we had a lot of people who were kind of sat at, I've read the document, but nothing else. So we can see some of those changes starting to take place. So thanks everybody for participating in those two polls. So before we get to our speakers, I just have a couple of uh, slides to share. Um, the first one is um, a call for speakers. So you'll see that we are at our second um, of eight um, in our webinar series. Um, they take place on the first Wednesday, Thursday, depending on the time zones of every month. Um, we are looking for speakers for the rest of the series. So if you are interested um, and you've got a, a great um, topic that you wanna speak of, um, it's 10 minutes, five slides. Um, and if you are interested, please drop me an email so we can add you to that schedule. And then my next slide talks about our topic for today. So today is all about chapter two, embedding multiple purposes of conservation education into zoos and aquariums. What I've added is the recommendation that sits within that chapter. So even though it has one uh, recommendation, it's quite a big one. And today's um, three speakers will be looking at aspects of how they fulfill those conservation education purposes. So to get to introducing our speakers and the format for today's webinar, we have three speakers. First, we'll hear from Becky Angus from the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. Then we'll go to Amy Stevens from the National Aquarium of New Zealand, and then Melanie Sorensen um, uh, and Melissa Wong from Houston Zoo in Texas uh, uh, in the US. Once we've uh, seen our three speakers, um, we are going to be joined on our panel by David Masingo, who's the IZD board representative and also the Africa regional representative for IZD and also the Manager of Education at the Uganda Wildlife Conservation Education Centre and also by um, Rachel Hayden who's the General Manager at the National Aquarium of New Zealand. So we've got a great selection of speakers and panellists for today's session. So just as a reminder, um, this webinar has been recorded and will be available to watch later on our YouTube channel and please start thinking of those questions you want to ask our panelists and our speakers. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Becky, we're going to go over to you. Becky is the Head of Discovery and Learning at the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland and that um, is the organisation that runs Edinburgh Zoo and the Highland Wildlife Park. So I'm going to stop sharing and then over to you, Becky. Hi, good evening everyone, or morning or afternoon, depending uh, where you are. Um, let me just share this for you. My computer has been uh, nicely slow tonight, so I apologize. Can anyone see my slide yet? Yep, Excellent. we can see your slides, but we need to go to the slideshow function. Yeah, it's lost my mouse as well. There we go. About it. Um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about who we are while my computer just thinks about there we go. Um, so RZSS is a wildlife conservation, conservation charity and we look after and run uh, Edinburgh Zoo and the Highland Wildlife Park um, and then conservation projects all over the world. 
And what we're going to be talking about tonight specifically is that side of discovery and learning that we look after. Um, and one of the things that we kind of did was really look at who we are as discovery and learning and what we wanted to be um, when we first started this journey. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our journey tonight um, and hopefully it'll resonate with some of you. You'll be on the same journey somewhere. Um, I would say we're not at the end of ours yet, but uh, we're getting a good way through it and it's really exciting. Um, exciting one to be on. So we have been through quite a time of change, as many organisations are. Um, in the last 12 months, we have had a new CEO um, who has himself put in his own ideas and everything with him. We have had me instead of Suzanne, who was previously head of Discovery and Learning. Um, we've obviously had the global pandemic, which everyone knows about. And um, we've had a change in directors as well. So there's this been this huge change within within the society itself and that itself has been a catalyst I guess towards some of where our journey has gone and where it's going to um, so in the words of Maria we'll start at the very beginning um, so we have spent a lot of time looking at who our ZSS is and what discovery and learning do so for a bit of an overview discovery and learning look after everything from the formal education to the informal on-site engagement to interpretation um, and volunteers. So we've got quite a broad remit. We're not a huge team. I know we're bigger than some. So we've got 10 full-time members of staff, including myself. And we look after all of those um, different areas and the delivery of all of it. So what we did was really look at where our strengths lay as a team and as an organization and then work out what we wanted to be as well especially with a new CEO and with new directors in place um, we really wanted to look at what the purpose we were fulfilling was but also what we wanted it to be so if we're looking like 10 years in the future um, what do we want um, you know learning to be at that point and why are we doing it and that took I would say a lot of time and a lot of backwards and forwards um, and to do it we talked to everybody so it was really interesting we got the team involved as soon as we possibly could um, we started doing this while the majority of people were on furlough um, so as soon as we could start having those conversations we we spoke to the discovery and learning team but we also talked to teams right across the society we spoke to service users and other service providers. Uh, we were at the IZE conference, which was fantastic. Obviously, we heard Sarah speak at that point about this strategy and what it what it meant and where it could take um, spaces. And we were all super inspired about that and what it could possibly mean to us. And those conversations went on for a good while. Um, you know, we spoke to um, our CEO David Field to get his ideas and his thoughts and also to share ours and where we wanted to take discovery and learning. We spoke to the directors, we spoke to the board, we spoke to the other heads of the departments right across the society to make sure we had a really informed opinion. First of all, we asked the question, what is learning? Which if you've ever asked that question, it just opens up an entire minefield. And then what is learning for us? And I don't know how uh, you guys feel, but we definitely had a lot of answers. Uh, we make signs and we lead school groups, apparently. Um, so that was one of the first challenges is actually opening people up to what we actually do and importantly, what we could do as well um, to make sure that not just strategy going forward, but that we were embedded within the society properly across those different teams and working really well with them, for them, in support of them, but also that we were using them as a resource in supporting and working with us. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking and um, probably me kind of like the little penguin in the bottom corner there. I spent a lot of time talking at people um, until we got to the monkeys there and we were all kind of starting to say the same thing, which was a really exciting point. Um, and then we started looking at the strategies. 
So what I would what I found really exciting and really interesting is when we started checking through the boxes, we were really surprised at what we actually found. So we had um, the Death Gupta report, which came out not that long ago, which we um, kind of restarted the process almost with. We have used um, this uh, education strategy. We also looked back at previous strategies for both the society and for, um, you know, across the Biasa strategies and everything like that. We also went out with um, our community and we looked at um, museums and galleries and all those people that teach beyond the classroom. We kind of started to look at just a whole board to see what other people were doing and also to see what we were doing. And what was really interesting is when we started to break down what we were doing against all of these other things, then we actually found we were doing a lot more than we maybe thought we were. Um, but also um, they, they really crossed over and they ticked off more than one box. So we have this amazing program called CAT, which if you've been at previous um, conferences, you'll have heard about the Conservation Action Team. You know, that on the surface could be seen as a behavioural kind of objective. But when you started breaking it down, you got all these really amazing emotional objectives come out of it. You got the um, using some of the words from the strategy there that awe, awe and inspire and um, learning and everything. So it was really exciting to see all of those different things that we already were doing, picking the right boxes. And as I say, we were really surprised at what we found. It also made us go through the process of having a look at our strategy. We were also at the same time going through a big um, National Lottery Heritage Fund um, submission for up at the Highland Wildlife Park. And as part of this whole process, we have now reevaluated the RZS strategy, the objectives and outcomes for that project, and then the um, education strategy as well and it all started with literally a very big list and a lot of check boxes and checking off where we where we worked and where we didn't and what was really important is working out for us what was right um, and that meant looking for some of the gaps so this was really interesting because I think when we first started the process, we expected to find gaps in what we were delivering, which we definitely did. But what we also found were that we were delivering in some places where other strategies, both as at assess um, educational ones out with the communities as well, where they didn't deliver. So it was a really interesting time of looking at the gaps that we wanted to fill, the gaps that we were maybe already filling that we didn't. Um, and that balance between where we wanted to go and what we could do currently, especially as the last kind of 12 months have been such a crazy reactive state. It was really interesting starting to look beyond that and starting to look at what the end could be and what the next 10 years could be. Um, and then we started looking at how we could fill the gaps. And what's been important is not just at the minute, not just filling them for the sake of. So there were some really great areas where we could fill it uh, quite easily, quite reactively, and I guess some quick wins so that we could see that positive change really starting to happen. But there's some longer term goals in place. And we really looked at the team and what the team and what the society could deliver. We went back out at this point and we talked to all those same people again. And we were like, this is where we're going. This is what we're thinking about. And just try to get them excited as well, um, which Touchwood seems to have worked so far. Um, and it was just really interesting kind of looking at what we wanted to do and where we wanted to go. And it almost going through that tick box list again and working out what programs we were delivering, but importantly, why? So not just doing it because we have done it for the past 10 years. Um, and this, I would say, so it's a really long road and we're definitely not at the end yet. And if there was anything I could share from our little journey that we've been on is to keep going with it. Um, we're still going through those changes at the moment. We're being really creative and trying to think outside the box, but also beyond the classroom, outside of the classroom. 
And we're really trying to make sure we're adapting to what's right for us. So using those other strategies um, and the reports as that kind of baseline and then working out what's right for us now, what's right for us tomorrow, and then what's right for us in 10 years. Um, and yeah, I think that is probably my time up almost. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. I hope that was useful um, for people and I look forward to some questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becky. Um, if you could just pop your email address in the chat box, if anybody does want to get in contact with you. Um, and yeah, it was uh, great to hear how you've used that recommendation uh, checklist at the end of the strategy to start that kind of thinking and process. So really great presentation. So we're gonna move uh, swiftly on to my side of the world, um, to New Zealand and to Amy Stevens. Amy is the education manager at the National Aquarium of New Zealand. Um, so over to you. Amy. Sorry, Sarah, I actually can't hear you. So I'll, uh, can you all hear me? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, we can. We yeah. can? Awesome, fabulous. Yeah. I was guessing right. that it was my turn when you all started going, not talking and your lips stopped <laughs> moving. So I'll just share my screen. Yeah, Bear with me. Yeah, we'll let you know when we can see it. Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you guys about, so good morning, first of all, how are you all doing? Um, I am Amy Stevens from the National Aquarium of New Zealand, we're based in Napier, and we've gone through a bit of a similar journey to Becky, but we've gone about it in a little bit of a different um, format and a different way. Um, we started our journey about um, two years ago. Um, when we knew we wanted to have um, some change, we needed to evolve and grow. Uh, but we're also going through a great period of reflection. We needed to um, look at why we were here and um, what we were actually here for. We needed to actually understand what learning we were actually getting um, out of our programming. Uh, but at the same time, we were going through a period of great reflection about our actual future as well as an organization. So it was, it was quite a, a challenging time. We're quite a small team. There's only four members um, in the education team and um, we had quite a static programming at that time. We had a huge menu of programs that we were offering our audiences and they were all delivered in the same um, didactic PowerPoint presentation style. So we knew we needed to um, evolve that and, and to change, but how did we do, how do we go about that and how we do that and what purpose and what road do we go down to get to that point was, was where we were at at that stage. So it all came together and we knew we had to ask a lot of questions. Um, so we sat down at a huge table and a humongous pile of post-it notes and we asked questions and we discussed um, and we collected a lot of information. So the kind of questions that we asked in these sessions um, were what memories were our audiences taking with them when they left? Um, were they positive memories? Were they great memories that they were taking with them? Um, and with those memories, when they left, what perception did they have of us? I really hoped it was a positive perception, but we don't know. Was, were they leaving thinking that they'd had a great experience and were engaged? What actual level of learning were they having when they were with us? Um, and also, how were we perceived? Um, as an organisation, we were perceived as somewhere that was a great place to go, where you'd be engaged, you'd find that awe and wonder, and you'd leave wanting to learn more. We also uh, were looking at um, how we actually gained those positive or inspiring moments, and how can we replicate them going forward into other programmes. We also started questioning what creates those awe and wonder. Is it the sit down PowerPoint didactic experiences, do they work for one audience? Do they not work for others? Do they work for nobody? Or do we need to start now piling in something else, some interactions, some hands-on? What do we actually need to do to get to that point? We needed to ask what empowers our audience to want to scaffold their own learning or to move off in a different direction. We needed to look at those shocking moments um, when we were actually engaging with our audiences and we saw the light bulb switch on, but we actually didn't know how that happened in that 
um, teaching moment, in that learning moment. And we needed to look at that and how we actually, how did we achieve that and how can we bring that forward and use it again? So we also went and looked back um, at the conversations we had with people. When we talked after sessions or after events, what were people telling us? What positive or negative feedback were we getting? And on our post um, visit surveys as well. So it's quite a lot of information that we compiled in these post-its. Uh, but when we started to read them and have a look, there were some real clear and obvious answers. Um, obviously, our wildlife was one main reason for people to come in and visiting us. Um, but also we needed to look at um, what came clear was also what we weren't doing right. So when we put these post-it notes into little piles, they sort of grouped nicely together, we gained um, six nice little groups and it kind of came to us that, well, maybe these are our purposes. Maybe this is what we should be doing um, and what we should be achieving. Um, so these are the six groups that we gained um, in that process. So what do we do from then on? Well, we had a look at that and we designed our little diagram here and I'll explain it to you to how we were gonna move forward. So we realized that our wildlife, our species were the core of what we needed to do. They encompassed and circled everything that we wanted to achieve. So they became the circle around everything that we wanted to do. And then on the left-hand side, we had our content. We had our learning, what we wanted people to, to leave with the knowledge of. And from our post-it notes, we saw that we wanted to have a really curriculum-based learning um, and how we achieved that. We started looking at different avenues. Notion literacy really popped up for us being an aquarium. Um, to have those seven ocean literacy principles for us to actually try and make ocean literate people and a generation ocean. So um, that really worked really well for us for that. Being in New Zealand, we knew we had to have indigenous knowledge systems. So we knew we had to um, put some learning in for Te Reo Māori and Mataranga Māori in there, which was really quite important um, for us being here in New Zealand. And obviously we had to have conservation issues. We knew we couldn't be negative. We couldn't be fatalistic in that approach. So we had to bring positivity um, into that. So that's what our content was. And on the right hand side, we had our pedagogy, which is our education theory, um, how we were going to bring about the learning on the left hand side. So we were chucking out those PowerPoints, chucking out the sitting down on the bums, and we were bringing in um, creative and imaginative and active participation. So um, we knew we needed that and it needed to be a core of all of our now programming going forward. We realized from the post-it notes that what had inspired before was when we told our stories. Um, when the staff and our partners told their engaging stories of when they were working with certain species, when they were out in the field helping with environmental projects, it inspired people and it made, made their eyes light up to think that they could actually do it. So we knew we needed to have a lot of that in there. We also needed um, katiaki, which is action, which would mirror the uh, conservation issue on the left hand side. Um, so we knew that needed to be brought in um, for those small actions to make people feel like they were actually engaging um, and helping out. So this is what we ended up with from our post-it note session. We then needed to audit all of our massive menu of educational programming to whittle it down to actually something that teachers can look at and go, oh, that's a bit easy to manage and I can now pick one and know what would actually suit me. Um, so we, as a team, divided up all of our educational programming and all took three or four and we audited them through a series of audit sheets. So what we did is we had a um, series of a few sheets that each educator would take a program and they'd benchmark it against quite a few things. They'd benchmark it how popular it was, what age group it used and we went back for about four or five years um, within that. We also then had a look at um, what people thought about it when they came. What did we think about it? What did we enjoy or not enjoy about it? And if we're not enjoying running these sessions, nobody's gonna enjoy it. So we needed to look at that. We also needed um, to look at what resources we were giving post 
um, educational sessions during when they were here and um, before. Um, so we had a look at all of those and then we benchmarked them against our um, guiding principles that we just developed. So we benchmarked them. How, did they have ocean literacy involved in them? Uh, did they have a, a cultural lens? Was the Mataranga Maori, the indigenous knowledge, was that overlaying over the top of our Western science nicely? Uh, we also then had, did it have active participation? If it didn't, we needed to figure out how we we're gonna get that in. So we went through all of our guiding principles and had a look how they all fitted. And we came up with programs that were not fit for purpose. They went out the door, um, no longer to be. We had a look at um, ones that were needed auditing and making more fit for purpose. They were missing something. So we brought in that active participation. This is where the creative round the table fun element kind of happened for us. So it's how can we bring in that real voice? How can we bring in that active participation, uh, ocean literacy and conservation to really build it up and boister it and make it more fun and engaging so we can keep it. Um, and then there was those obvious ones that were not working, chuck them out and the obvious ones that we actually kept. And we actually managed to whittle it down um, and cut half of our programming. Um, now we've got some really engaging uh, programs that we can um, offer our school audiences and that we can start to actually offer um, elsewhere as well. So what are we doing now? So we've been through this whole process. As I said, it's a journey, just like Becky's journey. Um, and we're only part way through that journey. Um, but looking back on the bit that we've done for the last two years, um, it's actually given our team a real positive um, future focused mindset. We actually know now having these set of six guiding principles and our nice little diagrammed framework, where we need to go and what we need to include within programming from now on. And that really helps um, when we have a, a school come in and want a bespoke session, we know now what elements we need to fit within that um, program to deliver a successful uh, learning outcomes. We also now have a long-term vision for a department, which is really lovely. Um, and it's strengthened our delivery styles. We don't sit there anymore with PowerPoint presentations sitting on our bums. You can find us outdoors in nature. You can find us all over the place and having discussion groups down in the ocean area. So it's, it's a lot better um, for us, more enjoyable for a work atmosphere as well, um, and for our school audiences. It's given us a real sense of team cohesion. We know everybody's strengths. We know everybody's weaknesses. We know where personal development needs to be lifted. Um, and we know when um, and who to pull in for certain aspects when things happen. We now need to move on and do a consultation with our audiences. So our schools, our Ministry of Education. We might have possibly should have done this at the beginning, but we didn't want to actually take on too much um, as a small team. We wanted to actually just have a look at ourselves internally first and reflect on where we were. So that's where we need to go next. We need to expand on our principles. We need to kind of um, make them a bit more meaningful um, for our audiences. And more importantly, now that we have them, we need to talk about them. And we need to talk about them with our other departments, um, which we're starting to do now. And we need to look at how we can incorporate these six principles into all of our marketing, into our promotion, our campaigns, um, our big events that we hold, our holiday programs, um, signage and interpretation, and our interactives. So we've got a lot of work going forward to, to slowly move our principles and um, forward into the rest of the organization. So that's what our journey was and I really really encourage you to do it it's been a positive positive thing to do hard work um, trying to fit in meetings for two hours to brainstorm about different programs but I really recommend that everyone has a go at it and, um, and starts your journey just by asking yourself some questions so thank you very much thank you so much Amy um you can see the slide with the um, email addresses on and if you want to again pop uh, those into the uh, chat box that would be great. So we're going to do our third shift in time zones and um, our last speaker is Melissa Wong who's the Director of Conservation Education at Houston Zoo. Um, a slight change to our kind of plan schedule um, and um, thank you so much Melissa for stepping in at the last minute. Melanie who was um, due to speak has lost her voice so we're not going to put her through that 
um, today. So um, welcome, Melissa, over to you, um, and you have 10 minutes. And while Melissa is kind of sharing her screen, I just wanted to say thank you to her. Um, she found out just a few hours ago that I lost my voice and she was able to step in. We've worked together for five years leading this team and she's gonna do great. So I'll turn it over to Melissa Wong, Director of Conservation Education at Houston Zoo. Thanks, Melissa. You are so welcome. It's my pleasure to come and join um, this afternoon and be with everyone kind of talking about these amazing journeys. And I'm listening to the panelists that went before and Amy, I just feel like, man, <laughs> our experiences have been very, very similar. Um, in 2016, our zoo went through a process of creating a zoo-wide strategic plan. Um, we had a new mission, a new vision, and with those new directions, we, it was really clear to Melanie and to I that our team needed to align with that new direction for the zoo. And we are thinking that your team and our team might be similar when handling change. Um, <laughs> So a lot of us can look like this wide-eyed owl um, or even a screaming frog, uh, sometimes even get our armor up, our defenses up like this puffer fish. So, you know, if you're nodding your head and like recognizing maybe yourself or some of your teammates in these photos, do not feel alone because we have all been there. Um, and for us, you know, really what that meant is understanding the audience that we are working with, and that's our team. Um, and that meant starting with what we knew to be true. So celebrating and revealing what our team was already doing well um, and framing the entire conversation is less about change and more about clearly articulating who we are and why do we exist. You know, we would talk to each individual team member and everyone, myself included, <laughs> would have a different idea of why we were implementing certain programs. So it was clear that we needed to be on the same page as well as clearly show how each role in our department was supporting us all moving forward into the central direction of where the zoo's mission and vision are. So although the zoo used uh, consultants, although we used consultants to facilitate this work, it's absolutely not necessary. The real resource, the foundation of how we made this work is finding time to discuss as a team. Uh, it was so important that we had to really look for and find time to take breaks from implementing programs for every single one of our team members. And for you that you know, are listening right now, I'm sure you're thinking, wow, you know, how does that even work? Because your schedules are so demanding. You're doing programs and meetings. And so it's, it's a big ask, but um, I think that's really what made it even possible for us to start kind of looking at where we wanted to go as a team. Um, and our team is probably also similar to yours and that we're all uh, perpetual learners. Um, so knowing that um, Melanie was really intent on sending us out to other zoos and really using our network and our peer groups to identify best practices in informal education. Uh, so a lot of those resources are on the call right now. We just want to thank each and every one of you for being part of our journey because you really helped us move our team forward. So after we cleared calendars and we discussed and we reflected, um, we really started revealing what we were already doing and we looked for patterns in that. So we involved other departments here at the zoo uh, in aspects of our process. We used documents that were already created by our zoo, including our strategic plan, value statements, um, similar uh, documents. And we didn't really, we didn't want this um, to exist by itself. We didn't want our plan or our framework to be um, individual or independent from everything else the zoo was doing. We didn't want to create a silo. We wanted it to dovetail or interconnect seamlessly with the direction of the zoo, the direction of the zoo. So we asked ourselves some very thoughtful questions about um, why we existed. And again, kind of going back to Amy's uh, presentation, very similar. It was a lot about just getting through some of these questions. Um, what change do we want to see in our guests? Um, what would happen if the entire education department at the zoo didn't exist? You know, what would that mean? Um, what is the purpose of our programs? Once we started asking this, these questions, it was clear that, you know, maybe we all had these different ideas and we needed to get on the same page and kind of start going in the same direction. 
So really trying to understand how our programs reflected our own values of what we want to achieve and what was a priority for our team to be impactful. And then most importantly, um, what change do we want to see in our guests? Uh, what is the result of participating in these programs? What is the result of our time and effort um, put into um, camps and uh, school programs? So after a lot of these conversations and discussions, um, the research that we did, it led us to a statement about why we exist. Uh, and that statement is we shape wildlife saving identi identities in our guests by cultivating a community of citizens interested, aware, equipped, and ready to take action to save wildlife. And I want you to really notice those two words that are highlighted, shape wildlife identities and ready to take action to save wildlife. We wanted to be realistic about what an educational program could accomplish as well, as well as an awareness of our guests um, that they're already coming to us from different stages on their wildlife saving journey. And we're gonna have to meet them where they are. There's so much talk about behavior change in zoos right now, but we wanted to have our programs focus on priming and getting our guests ready to do the actions, knowing that the purpose of our programs was all about setting them up for success, meeting them where they are and being a part of their wildlife saving journey. So these categories um, of increasing awareness, changing attitudes, um, that's really where we wanted to have some influence. We know that knowledge is important, but when we did the research, it showed us that it's not just knowledge alone that starts shaping people's identities. So we took that to heart. Uh, and you know, we might have a program that touches on a few of these categories, you know, not necessarily all in every program, but for us, it was about building blocks. It was about creating those building blocks that lead to equipping our guests to be ready to save wildlife. And we focused much more on motivating to change rather than the actual change itself. So with shaping these identities and revealing to guests the things that they're already doing and connecting them to how these actions help save specific wildlife, our hope is that they are primed for the behavior change campaigns that um, they'll encounter further down their journey. And as far as benefits, you know, Melanie spent some time um, just a few months ago asking each one of our team members kind of what benefits they saw after we've been working with our framework and our program purpose statements for a few years now. And these are their responses. So you can see that it extended far past, you know, just this final document, this final thing that we created. Uh, for our team, it's really meant that it's helped them stay focused as we've moved through different seasons of our team, through different changes. Uh, it's helped create new programs and it's depersonalized the sunsetting or pausing, letting go of some other programs. Um, it's made it easier, so much easier to pivot during, you know, times of dramatic change like we have all experienced in the last 12 months. You know, having a guiding document that we could funnel every decision through and we could really gut check with our team. Okay, is this helping us achieve our impact that we want? Is it helping us achieve the outcome that we, we all agreed was important, was crucial as we developed virtual programs and adapted those to exactly what our audience needed over the past year? It's also helped other departments in our zoo understand what we value and help support us on this journey, help us really achieve the intended uh, outcome. And it's of course helped us communicate to other um, external supporters. It's allowed donors to understand what's most important to us and what we're trying to achieve with the programs. So now they're more bought in to these programs and they come to us asking, okay, so where are you at with this outcome? And how, you know, do you see success here? We know this is important to you. So how is this working? So now those conversations seem to be richer and more beneficial. Uh, and it feels like our supporters are even closer now to the programs than they were before. And finally, I wanna share Melanie's uh, contact information. Um, and just, you know, from, I, I'm gonna speak for her, <laughs> um, but I'm sure she would want me to share, um, please reach out and we would be more than happy to share any documents um, or any uh, tips or tricks that we learned along the way. 
we have definitely benefited from this community. And so many of you have been resources for us on our journey. So it would be our pleasure to be resources in turn. So feel free to reach out. Um, and if you would like you know, to see the documents or even chat about challenges that we faced or challenges that maybe you're currently facing, we would be happy to do that. And I'm gonna pause for a second. Melanie, did I miss anything? <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> that was amazing, Melissa. Thank you so much. And for a couple of hours preparation, brilliant stuff. <laughs> so we have uh, 15 minutes left of our session and uh, we're going to come together with our three speakers. Uh, we're also joined by uh, two extra people. Um, we have uh, David Masingo, who is an IZD board member. Um, and the IZD African Regional Representative. He's also the Manager of Education and Information Department at the Uganda Wildlife Conservation Education Centre. Welcome, David. And we also have Rachel Hayden, who works with Amy, and she's the General Manager at the National Aquarium of New Zealand. So um, I, I'm going to go to Rachel first, um, if that's okay with you, uh, Rachel, um, because I had a question around, you're a General Manager, you're a Director of the organisation, and so I'm really interested, and I, I know a lot of our viewers are, is how, as a senior leader, have you kind of embraced and acknowledged the, the conservation education strategy and really kind of embedded it across the organisation? Great question. Um, I suppose it helps that I uh, am an educator at heart, so I get it. <laughs> um, it is a, a core function of everything that we do that zoos and aquariums are increasingly held accountable for, um, particularly with the language around behaviour change, attitudes, values, etc. Um, as we all know, it all also can be the first thing that gets cut when budgets get tight. Uh, so really acknowledging the value of what we needed to do um, moving into the space of a more modern aquarium because um, we were trying to um, as, as Amy touched on really identify what what learning was at the National Aquarium and, and having worked with yourself at Zoological Society of London and gone through this process around what is it that we do why do we do it how are we measuring it and and is it important, which are quite hard questions um, to ask yourself. But for me, the importance of it settles around, it, it really is the, the core of what everyone is doing. It, it is making sure we're talking about the same language. You're constantly going back to that, um, those underlying principles. Is, is it aligned with what we need to be doing as the National Aquarium of New Zealand? Does it have to our Māori, the world, you know, Māori worldview? Does it have Western science? Because in a country, um, you know, we're with two predominant cultures that we need to acknowledge, um, are, are we doing that correctly and respectfully? So for me, it was a complete no-brainer. It is something that we absolutely had to do. And seeing there was a strategy come out and really beautifully, eloquently uh, written with a checklist and what have you, um, it, we, what, we just aligned ourselves with that list and what we needed to do. Great, thank you. Um, Becky, I'm gonna to come to you next. We actually had a, a question in the chat box, um, which is from Heidi. And she asked the, the question about, you talked about gaps that you found when you did that process. And so um, the question was, what gaps did you find? So maybe what, what was one gap that you found and how did you start to think about getting that, that kind of filled? Uh, so I would say one of the huge gaps actually that we found um, was around community and really making sure both we were supporting the community but also that we were embedded within it and they saw us as part of their community. Um, so we have started by looking at when we say our community, what do we actually mean? Um, you know, we're in Edinburgh and we're in the Highlands. So is it local? Is it Edinburgh and the Highlands or do we look further? Um, so we've really started there with that with that one particular gap and it's opened up a whole load of questions um, and that in itself has helped influence our actual organisational strategy as well. So community has now actually been pulled out um, as a third of the strategy. It has its own lovely big section. Um, whereas before it was um, kind of hidden within engagement somewhere um, and it's now its own section and that's looking at 
who they are, how we can support them, how we can embed them, and really looking at those diverse audiences that we don't really reach properly at the moment, um, and how we can make sure we're inclusive and accessible and remove some of the barriers um, perceived or otherwise. Um, so yeah, so I think strat uh, the community has been the biggest one, and that in itself has led a huge change within the society. Great, thank you. Um, okay, we're going to move over to, to David, um, um, and a question about um, being an ISD board member and the regional rep for Africa. How do you think, if you're speaking to the, um, the, the ISD members who are based in Africa, how do you feel that um, the strategy um, is applicable and relevant to, to them and your region? Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. I think it's my pleasure to be part of this great team. In Africa, of course, we have a lot of challenges that is facing wildlife, more especially at this time where we have uh, wildlife trafficking, we have poaching, we have degradation of habitat, wildlife habitats, we have climate change here, we have the issues of waste management. So this document is very critical. It's very critical in addressing some of these issues, more especially at the community level. The behavior change. Uh, many people are degrading these resources, but applying this strategy, inculcating it in our facilities, it is going to help us to change behavior among our people in the communities and therefore promoting conservation of wildlife. So in Africa, we welcome this strategy, especially that provides the practical aspect, but also bringing about building skills and also imparting knowledge. So it is a very important document for us. And unpacking chapter by chapter, it's very good. It's making us understand it better so that we can incul inculcate it in the facilities in Africa. So we really welcome this strategy here. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And I appreciate you being with us um, because it is uh, nearly midnight over in Uganda. So thanks for your words of wisdom. Um, I'm gonna come over okay. to Melissa now. Um, and I guess this, this is a question for everybody, but we'll, we'll start with you. So you've all gone through um, a process of change. And I think our viewers and myself would be interested is like, what's different because of that? How does your team work? Uh, can you notice a, a different way of operating a feeling because of the work that you've done um, recently? Yeah, and Melanie, feel free to chime in as well. I think from my perception, um, what I'm seeing in my team and what I'm feeling from our team is a, just a clear idea of where we're going. So we're not wasting time asking questions, um, you know, trying to clarify, like, is this important to us? Should we be doing this? Maybe what if this, here's a shiny thing over here that sounds really exciting. Maybe we should look into that too. We've spent a lot of time articulating what's most important to us and what we want to achieve as a team. So now we have a very clear roadmap on where to go. It is just about working together to get there. So it makes the process more efficient. We are much more effective and we're seeing that in our evaluations that we're doing within our programs is that we're achieving what we set out to achieve. And I just don't think that we would have done that pri uh, prior to us articulating our program framework and our purpose statement. Um, it just feels like we are moving together as one unit really well. Great, thank you. Add anything, Melanie? Yeah. Thumbs up from uh, Melanie. So same question to Amy and Rachel. Um, Amy, do you wanna give your perspective? Like you've gone through this process. Um, what's changed, what's different? Well, for me, I joined the um, National Aquarium as the education manager was the process was um, underway. So I saw um, from my perspective, when I came um, into the team to what it is now, it's absolutely transformational. Um, the individuals um, in the education team are empowered to actually um, deliver and change. 
Um, when we first started, change was the scariest word in the whole entire world and people will hide under desks and run away from it. Where now we can start the whole, we can start a day and something big will happen and it's just water off, water off ducks back. We'll just go with it and everyone will run with it in a positive manner and there's no more um, big wide eyes and scary hiding under tables anymore. And the communication and the unity within that is really, really positive. And it's a really happier place, um, a more engaging and a more energetic place. So that's for me, that's what I've seen in the last 18 months, two years. Great, thank you. Um, anything to add, Becky? Maybe the, the same things? Yeah, I was going to say the same things. And um, I think what's exciting for us is we're not quite at that part where we've started to see all of it happen yet. So ask us in like two years. Um, yeah. And I think yeah. we'll be saying even more of the same things that you guys already have. OK, hey, so can um, I, I'm going to go. Sorry, to... sorry, oh, Sarah, can I just add one thing? Um, what's been really lovely to see is reignite, like reigniting passion and a bit more ambition from the team as well, really seeing themselves as professionals. Um, that's been really heartening to see. Great. Um, we have time for one last question. I'm going to go to one from Stephen Mullard. Evening, Stephen. Um, and he talks about um, do, how do you consider conservation education for your internal audiences, your staff and volunteers? So we've talked about guests and maybe our communities, but does anybody want to kind of say a few words about how you consider this the conservation education change, but with your staff and volunteers. Who would like to go? Oh, Rachel, you can go. Thank you. Um, oh, it, it's been incredible because I think, you know, obviously our animal teams um, might be involved in conservation projects and have a lot of knowledge anyway, but sometimes with our visitor services teams, we're getting people from hospitality and tourism that haven't necessarily worked in this space before. So what it's been really good for is we've started to bring this framework more widely into everything that we do. They can see really clearly what it is that we do, why our species are here and what they represent in that core messaging. So it's just it just means that we all understand what we do. We're all speaking the same language and we've got far more sort of cohesion as a team. Great, thank you. Okay, um, Melissa, do you wanna add some few more words? Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, I can speak to our engagement of volunteers for sure. Our volunteer team is part of our conservation education team and they look at um, our adult volunteer core just as if we were working with an education program, that is, a, that is one of our education programs. So they have their set of outcomes and there is a framework for that program. There's a purpose statement. And our volunteer team is really intentional about communicating with volunteers in a way that furthers their knowledge, their engagement with the zoo, connects them with the zoo and fosters that during the year. But then, you know, formative and summative um, assessments and evaluations of that program happen as well. And that can really tell us are we meeting those outcomes? Are we being successful? Are our volunteers connected to our mission and, and to what degree are they connected? And really understanding what that means for the individual volunteers that make up the core has been very beneficial. So, um, and I'm sure that's something that we would be more than happy to share with anyone if you're interested. But yeah, that kind of change of thinking about our volunteers as a separate education program, and they are a specific audience that we definitely wanna focus on. They are integral to the functioning of our organization has been key. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left. Um, Nettie, we're going to move over to, um, can we show the video? Um, and this is a video from uh, Francis, who um, is our membership coordinator for IZD, who has a few words to share about the benefits of being an IZD member. Yeah, I'll cue that up. Did you want to, did we do poll number three? We can do poll number three now or after the video, up to oh. you. Let's do the poll because that's easier. And then if people need to go, they can go. <laughs> okay, we're gonna do the poll now. Um, so this is the third poll and this um, hopefully you can see it in a few moments, just asks a bit of evaluation about this session. So for those that are watching later, there's two questions and it says, how valuable did you find this webinar on your journey with the World Zoo and Aquarium Conservation Education Strategy? And so you've got a few responses there. And then the second question says, what would you like to see in future webinars? So. Do you want to see more case studies, more speakers? 
you want to have a little more explanation of each recommendation? Do you want more question and answers, more chat with the panel? Or did we get it right? Have we got the right mix um, with this uh, format that we've had today? So take a few moments and fill in those two questions. I'm going to end this poll. Great. Share the results. Okay, so excellent news. The first question we had 61% saying that it was very valuable, um, this webinar. So um, great news for all the speakers and myself. Uh, and then uh, again, 52% said keep the, the same mix um, for this webinar uh, going forward. Um, and the second one was having more case studies. So um, We'll take that on board and um, uh, hopefully you will be able to see our um, next few webinars um, next month. So we're going to um, go over to our video now. Um, over to you, Nettie. Looking for more professional development and networking opportunities with fellow educators from across the globe? Why not grab the chance and join the ICE now? Found in 1972. Our vision is to conserve global biodiversity through effective zoo and aquarium programs. With our worldwide members' continuous effort, we conserve biodiversity through encouraging sustainable behaviors in people that visit zoos and aquariums. The International Zoo Educators Association offers three types of membership with a wide range of professional development programs and events for capacity building, information and resources, and networking opportunities for educators and professionals at only 20 US dollar a year for category one associate member. Do not miss our upcoming events, webinars and conference. Be part of the community. Join us now. Thank you, Francis. Um, so it's uh, just left for me to say thank you so much for our three speakers uh, and our panelists. And thanks for you viewers. Um, Join us next month for our third webinar um, and thanks for participating.